When we read uh, Paul's writings in 2 Timothy, the end of his life is near. And Timothy was one who was exceedingly close to him. And as you come down to 2 Timothy chapter 4, after admonishing Timothy, and for that matter, through Timothy, to all who would be preachers of the gospel and their responsibility, he comments on his state of affairs. And he says in verse 5 or 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now think of that terminology for a minute. I'm now ready to be offered. He always saw his life dedicated to God as sacrifice to Christ in service to him. Nevertheless, he would say of himself, it's not me that lives, but Christ who lives in me. Now that can be the case today of everyone. If we will abide in the doctrine of Christ, that's the only way Christ is going to live in anyone is by their submission to the gospel and as he directs members of the church, his family, to live for him. But imagine, I am now ready to be offered. And he talks as if he's about to make a trip on a plane or something. The time of my departure is at hand. Now, we all spent time talking about the meaning of at hand. If I say this water bottle's at hand, it's very near, literally, at hand for me. So Paul knew his time under the sun was coming to an end. And he says, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. And then he focuses in more on eternal matters. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And then he speaks of all who would be faithful to the Lord throughout their lives, and how it would be with them also on the day of judgment, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. If you read through the writings of the Apostle Paul, you will see that he had much to say, trying to help us as God by the Spirit through him in the New Testament gave us some sort of a picture of life beyond this life. And if you go back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Beginning in verse 1, he will say, for we know. Now that's good solid language. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. No maybes. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. Now watch it switch from a tent living as a pilgrim to something solid and sound that will not be moved. That we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What's the state here of the person laboring to serve God? And think of Paul's life in service to the Christ. He says, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Now, it's important to understand, and this had to be what was on the mind of Paul when he wrote to Timothy that we read to you earlier. He looked beyond the time of the Spirit being outside of a body. In fact, in verse 3, he says, If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. He describes the Spirit without a body as being naked. Thus, the Bible says so much about the resurrection of the dead, and especially we concentrate on the righteous dead. It has more to say about the righteous dead than it does about those lost. 
For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now if you go back to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, as Paul corrects false doctrine in the church about the resurrection, you will see he, by the Spirit, strives to cause people to realize as much as one can with a finite mind in this life, the difference in this mortal body and in the body that shall be in the resurrection. And he basically does it by saying, if you can understand differences in the glories of things in this life, such as a difference in the glory of the sun and the moon and so forth, then you ought to be able to understand as this body is fitted for this life, so the body for the next is fitted for that life. So again, he yearns for the resurrected, glorified body. But then this brings us over to the main point I want to make, found in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 2. Now while you're turning there or looking at what's on the screen, Keep in mind that the apostles all taught the same thing because it's the same Holy Spirit guiding them to set down the will of Jesus Christ concerning how to be saved from your past sins and how to live in the church. So heaven will be your home. And Paul would also write in Romans 8, 24 that it is this expectation of glory in heaven that Paul is talking about in these different places that should be upon our minds because it strengthens us to look beyond the affairs of this life. And it brings heaven nearer. It's as if we look to the day of our eternal redemption. And thus whatever is going on in between just doesn't impress us that much to bear upon us. We look for the day of glory. Now I tell you that if we were being persecuted like those brethren were for the cause of Christ, then we would even more so have what Paul speaks of and the New Testament tells us. But notice how John says what he says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Behold, I'll start with verse 1, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now think of what we've studied other places that the Spirit through Paul wrote as much as he could to explain to us the resurrected body. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Now what should that do to me as a member of the church? And every man that hath this hope in him. Now you see how Romans 8.24 fits here. Every man that hath this hope in him. This expectation with an earnest desire to receive the resurrected body. Purifieth himself. Even as he is pure. One of the great motivating factors of the expectation of glory in heaven in the resurrected body that's going to be like our Lord's is it makes us more determined in this life not to sin. To spend more time with the study of the scriptures. To spend more time thinking about the work of the church. To spend more time understanding and loving the brethren who all heard the same gospel who were motivated to obey it and to become members of the bride of Christ, the church, the family of God, the kingdom of heaven. And that it ought to move us then to be more determined to carry out the king's will in his kingdom. Brethren, we must get rid of this idea that if I love you, I don't offend you when you are in sin. Now, we're not going to come up and say that or articulate it, but watch your actions. Watch your actions. 
Here's what happens in our mind. I just can't say that to them. They may be offended. I just can't approach them about this conduct or what they're omitting in their life. I can't point out to them the truth of Matthew 6.33 as it's applied in their lives. When you read the Old Testament and the New Testament concerning godly people, you never see that disposition of heart. You never see faithful people and all that the word faithful means in service to God having an attitude because it means we don't love people to let them commit sin and then not do a thing about it. <coughs> Paul had not done that. I fought the good fight of faith. Now read Paul's life and you'll see that he did not hesitate to lay his life down in service to God and undergo all manner of hurt and persecution and privations for the cause of Christ. Just read what he says, how he gave himself for people. I sacrificed for others. And he would say, you know I love you. Look what I did. You know my life. He would say it to Timothy. You know what I've undergone for the cause of Christ. He didn't hesitate to do that. That was the proof of his dedication and love of God and faith in God and the gospel system. He would say that in various places. He would say it to the Ephesian elders, in fact. I, I labored among you night and day with tears. What does that say? About his desire for them to be faithful in all things. And thus he would say, I have fought the good fight of faith. I have kept the faith. I've completed what God called me to do. I've done what he said in the way he said it and for the reason he said it. And there's the example we do ourselves no favor at all to excuse one another in our sins. We certainly won't go to heaven. So what is it when we read 1 John 3, 2? Well, John says it causes us to purify our lives to think about the resurrected body and that we'll be like him. That it causes us to draw closer to him. Remember, James talks about drawing near to God and he'll draw near to you. But one of the ways to do that is contemplate eternity. We're all but one heartbeat away from it. We don't know whether this is our last day on earth. Paul says, I've done what I'm supposed to do, what God expected, what he charged me with. I've discharged my obligations. I've been faithful to him. Therefore, henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. What is that? We'll be like him, but we shall see him as he is. We'll have a glorified, resurrected body. Well, if we're going to understand 1 John 3, 2 and make it even more applicable and beneficial to us, when we think about the resurrection, we must first have a resurrected life here on this earth. Now, that means I'm using the word resurrected differently right now than the resurrected body like a to Christ at the end of time. We must die to sin. In the very plan of salvation, one is baptized into the death of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4. You're raised then from the dead, as it were, the watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life because God's forgiven your sins, all your past sins. But you know, that's the beginning point. Who many people want to make that the ending point? That's just the birth of water and the Spirit, John 3, 3 and 5. We're added to the church when we do that. Now we're on the road. Now we're in the growing up place. I suggest sometime you read uh, Paul's great letter to the Philippians and watch how he explains there is this growing that's involved and was even involved in his life. I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. That's what living in the church, the family of God, is on this earth. Once we're born into the family, then we grow and to develop. Part of that is focusing on heaven. Purifying our lives because of what's out there for us. Learning to be sacrificial and dedicated instead of trying to justify ourselves and living in this world. 
Look at what Paul had to say in Romans chapter 6. Because here's where he talks about that. I've already alluded to it when it comes to the matter of being baptized into Christ. But many times we go through Romans 6, 1 through, oh, I'd say uh, about verse 8. And we kind of stop there, but let's start with verse 8 and read on. Romans 6, beginning verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Well, that's right back where we started this lesson and what it concerns, the resurrection. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over Him. For in that He died, He died unto sin once, and in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. Now watch his application. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. And dead means separating. Separated for the practice, purpose, habitual life of sin. It's right the opposite now that you're in Christ. Your purpose is to do the Lord's will. That's all that makes any difference. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Notice you're alive unto God. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid, literally may it never be so. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey? Whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Now there's the follow-up of being baptized into Christ. There's the living of the Christian life. There's what Paul said, I've accomplished. I finished my course. That's what I did. That's being faithful. And that's what it means. We must die to the ways of the world. Paul didn't just write this here. To the church in Colossae, he made it clear in Colossians chapter 3. Talking in the same vein, actually, as he did in Romans 6. Verses 5 through 9 of Colossians 3. Put to death, or mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now watch. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. You know, this is sort of a commentary on the meaning of Romans 6, isn't it? You don't live this way anymore. You live otherwise. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. See, you have to die and be resurrected in this life. You die to the habitual purpose, practice of sin, and you do that at repentance because it's a dead man that's buried in water for the remission of sins and raised to walk in newness of life. Notice verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. After the image of him that created him. No wonder then that those who die faithful at the judgment are going to possess the actual kind of body that's eternal that the Lord has in all of his glory. And now we're back to 1 John 3, 2. We don't know what we'll be like, but we'll be like him. But we'll see him as he is. We must continue to conform to the death of Christ. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi in chapter 3, 10 and 11, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection 
and the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. Now here's where we fail because we don't have the attitude he's about to express in this next sentence. If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Can you honestly with all your heart say, I want to attain the resurrection of the dead no matter what it takes in my thinking and in my life. And frankly, there are some who just aren't. They still think they can serve God with reservations. That they can reserve something about what they want and what they like of this world even when it comes between them and rendering obedience to God. And no amount of pleading and begging and warning in sermons like this and the song we sang just before it, which echoes the sentiments of these words, really cause people to cause, to cause them to sit down and meditate on how they're living every day of their lives. So we must be resurrected first in this life Thus, we must die to sin. We must do that in the obedience to the gospel. And we do that as a believer who's repented of sins and confessed his faith in Christ when we're baptized for the remission of sins. It's the only way to be resurrected in this life is to be resurrected in his likeness. Now, pause here and think how many people tell you you do not have to be baptized for the remission of sins. Wouldn't you think the devil would try to get you to understand that? To get you to believe that lie? When the more you study the Bible, the more you see how it all fits. Baptism shows our faith in God's power to be resurrected. You have that in Colossians 2 also, which again parallels much of the first part of Romans chapter 6. In Colossians 2, 11 through 13, in whom also ye are uh, circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcisions of Christ. How did that happen? Buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, which hath raised him from the dead. Now, what is the significance of that? And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcised, uncircumcision of your flesh, what has happened in your obedience to the gospel, in your baptism? Hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses? What a wonderful thought. Paul preached that. Paul wrote that. All the apostles taught it. It's a part of the apostles' doctrine of Acts 2, verse 42. Now the power of baptism according to Peter is in the resurrection of Christ. A like figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now look how he ends it. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why, obeying Christ in baptism would be worthless if he hadn't been resurrected from the dead to die no more. And we've already read that earlier in the introductory passages from Paul as we started this sermon. And this is how we do that, that we might attain the body that the Lord has for us in the resurrection of which John spoke in 1 John 3, 2. We have been resurrected to walk then that new life that we read about a while ago in Romans 6, 3 through 11. We've been resurrected to seek the things which are above. It's talked about in Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Well, how do I do that? Don't you know what that means, to seek those things which are above? It means to abide in the teachings of Christ here. That's how a person is spiritual, is to do what he said. Thus, the writer of Ecclesiastes would say, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Brethren, you see people all around us. They can get so enthralled and interested in the affairs of this world. You watch brethren in what we talk about. How many of us spend time about things of the kingdom and the work of the church and opportunities, things we can do? 
plans we're making. Well, we don't. We talk about everything the world talks about. And that, that reveals something about us. It shows where our deep interests really are. Set your affection on things above. That's my job. I have to train myself to love godly things. Not on things on the earth. These things are going to burn up and be gone. For you're dead. And your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, now he echoes the sentiments of John, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. But you've got to die to the ways of the world here and be interested in the truth of Jesus Christ and the work of his kingdom and your individual growth and development as a Christian. We do this, of course, by changing our minds. You know, if your minds ever change, you're going to have to do it. <laughs> we might encourage you and your wife or your husband or your children or your parents or somebody may encourage you to will to change your way of doing. But if it's done, you're going to have to do it. Now, Paul knew that. It's interesting that it's after Romans 6 that Paul tells us what he does about this transforming of the mind. So when you come to chapter 12, verse 1, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Here's the only way it works. By the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's just the formula. That's how it works. It works no other way. I must will to submit to his will. Then we will have to be in a resurrected body as we've seen in the sense of the body being the church and each one of us are Christians. There must be this death then there must be the life that we've already referred to. This is the death of our body that he speaks of when we actually have our spirits leave our body. 1 Corinthians 15, 36. That which thou sowest is not quickened nor made alive except it die. Heaven won't be your home unless you die here first to the things of this world and then physically die by your spirit leaving this. Paul knew that. The time of my departure is at hand. It's time for me to make that journey. But he tells us 2 Corinthians 5, he didn't look for the time of the disembodied spirit. He looked for the time of the resurrection. And so John centers in on that in 1 John 3, verse 2. To the resurrected, glorified body like unto Christ. And we're told in Romans 8, 24, that helps us be in greater faithful service to God. Paul continues to say that the first body, the one we're in now, is corruptible. Verse 42 of 1 Corinthians. And on through, it's dishonorable, it's weak, it's natural. So it must die, it's fitted for this world and things of this world pass away. You see, this means that this is a place of probation, a place of a pilgrim, a place of a sojourner, a place of serving God here by faith that we might show Him we want heaven to be our home. Our death, when we physically die, James tells us the body apart from the spirit is dead. That's the most simple definition of death I can come up with. But in Revelation 14, 13, Blessed, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Think of Paul and all he had undergone. The time my departure is at hand. It's time to go rest. My labors are over. I've been faithful. I've kept the faith. I've fought the good fight. One of the great blessings that older folks have who have served God faithfully all their life. The younger folks just don't have yet. There's just some things, as an old preacher told me when I was very young, that you won't appreciate about the Bible till you've lived it over a period of years. Then you'll understand things that you can't understand as you ought while you're younger. One of the things is you're closer to glory. 
and the things of this life just does they just don't mean much to you anymore. Young people still are trying to say, how am I going to work and earn a living and how am I going to do this? And the Lord's saying, I've already told you. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. But now when you reach stage, some of us, and even older, things of this present world just don't amount to a hill of beans. Now if you never know what a hill of beans is, you'll just have to go back and study it. The death of the natural body is not in vain for the faithful child of God, for the Christian. It's so natural, but it's raised a body fitted for eternity, 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44. There are those who have no hope. We have hope. That's the very idea. It's not a wish. It's a reality, an expectation that God says we ought to expect. But it's more than that. It's that earnest desire to possess it, to hold it as it were. And thus you read again 1 John 3, 2. The resurrected body is in his image. I don't know what all that means, but it suffices to know it will be like him. It's the image of power, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49, in contrast to the weakness of the flesh. It's the image of victory, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 57, in contrast to how many times things seem to be breaking apart here. It's the image of abundance, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. No lacking, all things flawless. And then we'll live forever in heaven. Nobody's going to live forever here. You've got to come to an end. And we ought to anticipate it. We ought to realize it. You ever notice how we just with, you know, we're almost like some of these cartoon characters. They're scratching and clawing on the wall to hang on to here. Why? Pray tell why. In all that God's good word has told us, heaven is our eternal home. That's pictured plainly. We won't go back and read it now, but read Matthew 25. Picture of the judgment for the saved in verses 34 through 46. And all of the blessings that they're going to have. And then the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 14 said, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, if I don't know my Bible, I don't know what that peace is. And I don't know what holiness is. And I don't know how it is that I live that way. But if I know my Bible, if I know the Word of God, if I understand the will of heaven for how I should live here, then I have a different view of all things from those who are anchored to this world. You know, Jesus said one time to his disciples, I have meat which you know not of. I would tell anybody... That you can be so different from the world because you have knowledge through the Word of God and thus insights to which so many don't have, especially those outside the church. And I'm sorry to say, even those who are too much like the world in the church. In Revelation 21, 27, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. I Paul knew that. Time of my departure is at hand. His is an image of glory and honor, and only those who glorify and honor him here in faithful obedience to his will will live in heaven. His image of glory, consider some passages. Revelation 5, 11 through 13. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts or the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying 
blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. We conform to his image and we glory in the things that pertain to serving Christ. And we work for the glory then that is eternal. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, Paul says, For which cause we faint not. We don't give up. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, and my dear brethren, that's where we too often look, gaze, and meditate. But we shouldn't. But at the things which are not seen. But you can't do that if you don't know your Bible. For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. I'd much rather contemplate the eternal. His is an image of light and life. And only those who have the light and life in their lives through belief and obedience to the gospel and daily Christian living are going to enter heaven. Again, notice 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. Paul says, Be not thou, thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace. That's the gospel, folks. As Paul wrote, had written earlier, the power of God to save is in the gospel, Romans 1.16. That's why he said, I'm not ashamed of it. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Back there in eternity, then God purposed these things. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. Now watch it. Through the gospel. Now back to the last book of the New Testament. Revelation 21, 23 through 25. John writes, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. How much we dwell on this world when we ought to be dwelling on the next, that it will cause us to purify our lives because it will strengthen us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that's the last verse in the great chapter in 1 Corinthians that Paul penned concerning the resurrection itself. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Some years ago in a gospel meeting, and I was probably no more than about mid-twenties or I guess later a little bit, but I wasn't out of my twenties. The preacher that was preaching in this gospel meeting was as old or older than my parents, but he had a premature heart condition. And it was bearing up on him. He did several heart attacks. Didn't have the treatment then that they do now, although it had progressed in those days, what it had even years before then. But we sat up late one night and talked about the prospects of glory, what it would be like to experience the transition from this life to the next. Talked about scriptures like we've talked about today and how they encourage us to press on and keep on. Meeting ended and I journeyed home. About a week later, the phone call came and he had made that transition. I often contemplated and thought about that. How he must remember that. And so it is with all who have died faithful to the Lord. Though they be few when contrasted with the multiplied millions who'll die like the one on the cross who would not change in the proximity of our Lord's own death. How much we have going for us as children of the living God. How much we take for granted that we should not. And how we need to count our blessings every day. There is an eternity 
just beyond our mortal eyes, which all things are done totally different from the way they're done here. I know one thing. I'll be beyond the tempter's snare. I'll be beyond the labors of fighting the fight of faith. I'll be beyond being lost in sin. The reality and the joy and the glory of that place shall dispel all the affairs that you put up with in this life, whether it be from false brethren or those outside the church or whatever kind of persecution, and from wherever it comes to be able to enjoy the perfection that those who die in the Lord have. How we so hurt ourselves by not meditating on those things that God has given us to pick us up and move us on and help us rise above the affairs of this present world for they're fleeting and passing and someday the whole system will come to an end. If you're a person outside of Christ, how can you continue to anchor yourself to that which is coming to an end rather rapidly to hold strictly to the flesh and its infirmities? Why not put your hope based upon the good gospel in Christ Jesus and your love and obedience to His will as we studied earlier? As a child of God, are you nurturing the thoughts of glory? Are you noticing the scriptures that are written mostly to Christians about the resurrection and how it should encourage you to not let the affairs of this life take over your mind? These things all shall pass away, but there shall be an eternity And now we must make the choice of where we shall be in eternity. If you're not ready to obey the gospel, I don't know what else I can say to get you to be ready. I just urge you to do what you know the Bible says. If you're a child of God and you let things of this world enter into your life and handicap you, we ask you to be humble and meek. And remember when you obey the gospel to become a Christian, maybe that will help motivate you to repent of whatever sin's hindering you now and to come to Jesus. For that's what the gospel's all about, is to save souls and to keep us faithful. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, then we invite you to come while we stand and sing.